Good evening and welcome to this edition of Making the Case. I'm very pleased to be back with you on this Wednesday evening. I must take this opportunity to apologize for my absence over the last two weeks, but this was due to my parliamentary obligations and the debate and subsequent passage of the national budget. I want to welcome everyone who is joining me this evening. If you're joining me on Facebook Live, on whichever page is, is streaming and you're joining me from, please help me to share this program so that uh, we can connect with our people once again. If you're joining me on television, good evening to you. I'm very pleased to be coming into your homes and to be once again uh, spending this hour with you on this Wednesday evening. If you're joining me on Freedom Radio, welcome and good evening to you as well. It's always a pleasure to be able to speak directly and frankly to our people. And so I, I cherish the, the time that I have on television to be able to speak directly uh, to people and to be able to speak frankly on what all that is uh, taking place in our country and to bring you up to date with all of the progress that we've been making and more importantly to address a lot of the false narratives, misconceptions, uh, fake news and all of the attempts to mislead our people. So please once again um, help me to share this program so that uh, we can reach our Guyanese brothers and sisters wherever they are, whether they're here in Guyana or in the Caribbean or in the diaspora in New York, in England, in Canada, everywhere. So this evening I want to spend some time discussing the budget. I know a lot of people tuned in during the debates and um, listen, some were uh, very committed to listening to all of the debates, every day of the debates, and um, that is very important. And I did say that on the program before the start of the budget debates, I asked people to tune in because it was important for people to listen not only to the plans and programs that we are presenting in the national budget, but also to have a first-hand look at what the opposition has to offer and the lack of competency, capability, the lack of any ability to analyze the budget or to contribute to the debate in any meaningful way um, on the part of the opposition. And people need to see that too, because at the end of the day, the party who's in government, that is in government, and the, the major opposition party, we come up against each other. And in the true spirit of a debate, you have to take into consideration what each side is saying, and you have to respond. And the members of parliament on the government side uh, is, we're very gifted in doing that, in keeping with the spirit of a debate. So our MPs don't go to parliament with a prepared speech that they will go out there and read regardless of what is said in the house. That comes from the side of the opposition. So they come to parliament with prepared speeches and whether or not it is relevant to what the previous speaker said, um, they are there to do one thing, to read this script. And even if it's tone deaf, uh, even if it does not respond in any way to what the previous speaker said or whether it has any relevancy at that moment, they will read that prepared speech regardless. But that is not in keeping with the 
the true spirit of a debate. And while we would very much appreciate um, a raise in the level of the conversation, you have to, we have to respond sometimes to exactly what is emanating from the other side. And if we hear blatant lies, and I can say lies here, I can't say that in, in the parliament. I, I have to improvise with my language when I'm in the house. Um, but really and truly, we sat in the house and heard blatant lies coming from the members of the main opposition. And when you sit in parliament and you have to speak after somebody who goes on the floor and openly and blatantly lies about something that can easily be uh, debunked, we have to address that. So we cannot ignore what is said in the House and not correct it and not set the record straight. It is important for us to do that. And so sometimes people say, you know, they want um, the members on the government side to ignore what is coming from the opposition side and just speak about the work that we're doing, speak about our plans and our programs. And of course, of course we will do that. But we cannot allow people to stand on the floor of the house, speak open, blatant lies, and not correct the record. We have to do that. And so when the opposition, one after the other, members of the opposition come on the floor and say that this is a, a budget for friends and, and family and cronies, we had to remind our people, we had to remind the opposition and you know, I would not miss an opportunity to respond to them. So we had to remind them that it was a member of their party, it was Vola Lawrence, who said that she would only give work to PNC people. And so it's very hi hypocritical for them to sit in the house and talk about the budget being for friends and family when they were openly saying, when they were in government, that they would only give work um, to people with party cards, with PNC party card, or members of their party. It was the opposition who, when in government, gave a contract for the feasibility study for the Harbor Bridge to a crony. Openly did so, somebody who helped and supported them to uh, win the elections in 2015. And, and we can go on and on, and I can list all of the, the, the projects um, that they were involved in, where they rewarded um, friends and family. And we all know about the, the other examples too, of awarding scholarships to themselves of giving scholarships and providing funding for scholarships for their own children. You don't see that happening under our administration. And so when they can stand up and accuse our government of passing a budget that will benefit friends and family and cronies, we have to remind them of their track record. So that's not something you can just ignore and not correct. Now, people have short memories. And when we're speaking in the house, while we are responding to members of the opposition, we are also speaking for public consumption. And so when members of the public are tuned in, they have to, yes, know exactly what the budget is about and what is in the budget for them, but also they need to understand, they need to do a comparative analysis of these two parties that are debating in the House. And they need to understand which party lacks vision 
which party lacks competency, and which party has a failed track record. That is the opposition, the combined APNU AFC opposition. And on the flip side of that, they have to understand that this government, the People's Progressive Party civic government, they need to understand that we have a vision, that we have the experience, that we have people with the right capabilities, competency, to get the work done. Because at the end of our term, at the end of every five years, there will be an election. And people are constantly having to compare parties because people have a very important decision to make every election cycle about which government they would like to see in office. And they have a say, and they have a vote. And the People's Progressive Party Civic has always been the party that will fight for democracy, that will support democracy, that will implement measures to protect and preserve our democracy. And so we believe in earning the votes of our people. We believe in earning support. We do not have a track record of undermining democracy. We do not have a track record of stealing elections, rigging elections, manipulating results. We have no such track record. We may not agree with everything that is ventilated in the public, but we believe that people have a right to air their views and to have their opinions, and we will fight for the protection of that right. And so when you are looking to compare leaders, you're looking to compare political parties, and you're looking to make an honest assessment you have to start from there. You have to start from the very basic thing. Which party will fight for my right to vote? Which party will fight for my right to speak freely and to have my own opinion, even if it is a dissenting opinion? And that is without a shadow of a doubt the People's Progressive Party Civic. So we are good for democracy, and we know uh, which party has not only recently tried to undermine elections and, and undermine the results of a legitimately held elections, but we know which party has a track record of rigged elections. And we had 28 years of the the PNC uh, trying to, well, trying and succeeding in rigging elections up until the restoration of democracy in 1992. And so even in 2020, we had to continue that struggle. So while we were debating the budget, we have to speak about all of these issues because context context is extremely important and every week when I come on this program and there's a reason it's called making the case because I believe that every political party has to make a case you have to speak to people you have to convince people that you have a vision that you have the right plans that you have the right programs and if given the opportunity to lead, you have to honor those commitments. You have to make, you have to then convert your vision to reality. And you have to honor the commitments that you make to people. And you respect people by doing that, by keeping your promises, by honoring your commitments, by working hard, and by working to earn their future support as well. And I think that without fear of contradiction, 
The PPPC has been doing a tremendous job over the last uh, two and a half years. In a few months, we'll be three years in office. And the amount of progress that we have seen in such a short period of time is unprecedented. And I know that some people are still waiting for maybe their house lot, maybe their water to be uh, treated, maybe they're waiting on that NIS pension, maybe they're waiting on their street uh, to get upgraded. And I say to them that every day we are working to make the lives of our people better. And every day when we see progress, we must take that as an installment of our government working to honor our commitments. And we are trying hard. And if there was more that we can do and then we can do it at an even faster rate, we will. And we are using all of our energies. And, and His Excellency um, is a prime example of that, of making the most of the 24 hours that we have every day in ensuring um, that development comes to every single person. I'm not saying that we're perfect, but I'm saying that if anybody takes an honest look at the work of the government and the achievements um, that we have been able to, to accomplish over the last two and a half years, uh, they will see that the government is committed to getting that work done. And so even in the parliament, even when it comes to being present in the House during the debates, during the consideration of the estimates, it's not easy. We go there from 10 a.m. and we're there until we are finished with the business of the day. And we do that for two weeks every year for two weeks, one week for the debates, one week for the consideration of the estimates. And it's a lot of hours that we have to put in. And even that, we cannot get the opposition to be present, to sit there from start to finish. You know, sometimes when I say that they're, they're lazy and we can't get them to work, you know, pe people think it's funny, you know, but it's, it's absolutely true. We can't get these people to work. They come in the morning, not on time. They waltz in when they, when they please. They make their presentations. As soon as they're finished, they leave. They hang around. They're not in the house, but when um, it's lunchtime, you see them. We don't know where they are for the last few hours, but they appear. Um, during the breaks or um, at lunchtime, and then they disappear again. You go back in the house, you don't see them. And especially uh, when it gets late into the afternoon, they disappear completely. And we have to carry on with our business. And this is how it has been, not only during the, the budget debates, but this is how it's been since 2020. You don't see that commitment from them and then they they get up and they make presentations riddled with inconsistency riddled with falsehoods they can't decide even on a line in which they will critique the budget so without even getting into the details of the programs that we have proposed in this budget, without even getting into the details, they could not decide among themselves, the 31 of them, they could not even decide among themselves whether they will take the line that the budget 
doesn't do enough or whether they will take the line that um, this budget is something that they crafted. So we had members of the opposition getting up to speak to say this budget is visionless, this budget has no direction, this budget does nothing for, for ordinary people. And then you have, right after that person, you will have another speaker, you'll have the, a, pres a presenter from the government side, and then you will have another opposition member coming. And then that opposition member will stand up and say, all of the plans and programs that are being proposed in this budget was conceptualized by the APNU AFC when they were in office. Completely contradicting what the other member of the opposition just said a short while ago. So they, not even that, they can't get right. If they're taking the line that this was our budget and this is, these are programs presented by the AP and UAFC, then all of them are supposed to get up and may present arguments and make representation to show that. But not even something as basic as whether they are going to em embrace these programs and, and proposals as their own or whether they will say it's no good, it, it lacks vision um, and does not serve the people of our country. Which says very clearly and sends a signal that they're not even caucusing, that they're not even sitting together as a group as the opposition and deciding what line are we going to take? How are we going to critique this budget? And how do we, while critiquing the budget, proffer programs and projects to show that we have a plan that is superior to the PPP's plan? They're completely incapable of such a basic analysis. We haven't gone into the details yet. I'm talking here about just deciding whether you will endorse these projects, this is the opposition, whether they will endorse these projects as their own and say, yes, these projects are good, but it is our vision, or whether they will say none of it um, is good for the country. So not even the basic approach to critiquing the budget. We haven't even gone into the details yet and they can't get that part right. So the, the, the lack of leadership is the cause of that. Little League Aubrey Norton cannot pull the, the, his 30 himself and his other 30 colleagues in the main opposition together and to for them to decide how they're going to approach this budget. It is very clear, it is abundantly clear that he lacks the capability um, or even the ability to lead that party and to, to unite that party. They cannot get their own house in order. How are they going to run a country? He cannot even get his 31 members, himself and 30 other members, in a room to decide how they're going to approach this budget, how they're going to approach the debate, how they're going to approach the line of questioning during the consideration of the estimates. He can't even shepherd 30 people. And he wants to present himself as a president in waiting. That is a joke. That is a joke, and if that is what is being offered um, in place of the government that you have now, the people who support or the supporters of the opposition have some serious uh, analysis to do, and they have some serious um, considerations. And I think anybody who can give an honest assessment of the government. Even if you do not support 
the PPP. I don't understand how any rational person can still give their support to the APNU AFC. So, and you know, we have division among them. And, and just before the commencement of the debate, we, have the, we had the tape that was leaked with my Paul and, and Royce Dale and the, the treasurer with the whole blank check uh, scenario. And it's the same thing you got during the, the budget debates. Blank checks, no value. They were not able to present a single argument against the budget, a single plausible argument against this budget. How can you say this budget is not for ordinary people when you have significantly increased allocations for housing, ensuring, securing another 10,000 house lots this year for our people? How can you say this budget has nothing for ordinary people when monies are being allocated to ensure people on the coastland have access to treated water, to ensure that people in the hinterland, our Amerindian communities, have access to water? How do you say this budget has nothing for ordinary people when pension has been increased, when the cash grant for the school children have been increased, when the income tax threshold has been increased, and now removing, I think it's about 12,000 12, people, um, 12,000 taxpayers from that tax net, thereby allowing um, people to have to take home more and, and for less to be taxed on their salaries. How do you say that this budget has nothing for ordinary people when um, there's been $3 billion in salary adjustments, uh, benefiting 5,000 healthcare workers, 9,000 members of the, and 9,000 members of the discipline services. Are these our friends and our families? Yes, as President Ali says, yes. They are all our friends and families. We will take care of every single school child in this country as though it is our children. So yes, it is our friends and families. It, it's our kids. It's our children that we are looking after. They spent, and I made this point in, in Parliament, they spent $1.8 billion in the water sector. 1.8 billion with a B billion dollars in the water sector through a corrupt transaction to procure a chemical called Sequest that uh, Van West Charles, who was the managing director of GWI during the, the five year, the new five years, to acquire, to procure a chemical to treat water. And this treatment is a temporary treatment because you have to keep procuring this chemical and adding it to, uh, to the water so that people can uh, receive treated water. And they, they, they use this chemical in some parts of the country, not all over, or region two mostly. And the $1.8 billion that they spent for which we can't find any receipts, for which there was no public uh, tender and all of that. This was a direct um, engagement with a, a private contractor and the payments were being made directly. So no public tender process, uh, completely bypassed the procurement rules and regulations. The average cost to bill a treatment plant a large treatment plant is $1.2 billion, less than what they spent on a temporary chemical to treat water. We are building treatment plants that will last decades and that will see thousands of people receiving treated water 
for, for decades to come. And this is, this is a permanent solution. Now, of course, this takes a longer time to implement because we have to do the designs, we have to go out uh, to, the, to the public tender process, we have to evaluate those tenders, we have to award a contract, then that contractor has to build that treatment plant. And so it will take some time, it will take a year, it will take a year and a half from the time that um, the contracts are signed. And we have signed seven already. Last year saw the, the arrangements, the, the contracts being signed for the construction of seven new treatment plants. And those will commence this year. This year we have a further six contracts to six treatment plants um, to, to, to sign so that we can commence construction in the latter part of this year. So it will take some time, but it is a temporary, it, will, it is a permanent solution that will serve hundreds of thousands of people for years to come, for decades to come. We do not have to keep reinvesting that money all of the time. So when they talk about, oh, we're taking oil money and, and um, we should be giving uh, more money to people or, or giving cash to people. These are the solutions that we have to work on so that we can improve the lives of our people. So in, in every area, I just used one example there. To, for you to compare and contrast the level of investment that they made to enrich themselves. So $1.8 billion on, and that's one transaction. Remember, we said when they took away the $10,000 cash grant from our school children in 2015, it would have only cost them, um, I think it was $1.2 billion at that time, to give $10,000 to $10,000 cash grant to each school child. It was just over a billion dollars, right? And here they were, and we said, and, and to give people a comparative analysis of, of what they spent a $1.2 billion on was more food in government. But here is another example. They spent $1.8 billion, almost $2 billion, on a temporary water treatment that today is benefiting no one. It just enriched uh, people in government through that uh, corrupt transaction. And the people are, our people, ordinary Guyanese, are no better off. So what we are doing, the plans and the programs that we are implementing, is to improve people's lives, is to give people a better quality of life, is to raise standards of living. And this will last them for decades and for their lifetime. And that is the development that we are talking about. Giving people um, a check does not improve their quality of life. You still need access to basic services. You still need access to electricity, to water, to proper healthcare facilities. You need access to, to proper education. So what are they proposing? We give away the money. We don't build any hospitals. We don't build any schools. We don't build any houses. We don't invest in infrastructure that will create house lots for our people. We don't improve the water sector. We don't invest in tourism so we can have um, foreign investors come into our country, investors as well as um, tourists who want to come in and enjoy Guyana and spend money and to, to improve our economy. We don't want any of that. Is that their suggestion? It would seem so because that is what they argued during the budget debates because that is popular. That is a catchy thing, you know, if people are watching and listening to them speak, it would be a very popular thing and it's a very catchy thing to hear, oh, yeah, the government has, the country has a lot of money and you have 
a lot of oil, so we should just give away the money. But that is not a sustainable model. And anybody who really takes an honest assessment, really does an honest assessment, and really asks themselves, does that make sense? The answer would be a resounding no. And you don't have to be a very highly educated person to come to that conclusion. People know that. People understand that. But we must not get carried away with empty promises and false narratives. That is all the opposition is good for. And then you have some people like TikTok, Glenn, and, and all of these people who they themselves too are incapable of any serious analysis and offering alternative solutions to real issues that people face in our country. They run away from dealing with hardcore topics. They run away from getting into details. But it's very easy to say, oh, we should give people more money. Oh, we, we receive so much um, billions of dollars in the Natural Resource Fund, so we should give everybody the, the money. In fact, in fact, a member of the opposition got up in Parliament and said very profoundly and with great confidence that we should just take the $781.9 billion and we just divide it by 750,000 people and just give everybody the money. A member of the opposition, imagine these are elected people, actually got up and said that. Sinclair, you can go listen for yourselves. That is what he said very confidently. That would be a better plan than, than the plans and programs that the PPP are presenting. So we can forget about all of the public servants. We, don't, we shouldn't pay any salaries because we're taking the entire budget and we just share it out to everybody. So don't, we shouldn't build any roads. We shouldn't build any schools. We shouldn't build any hospitals. We shouldn't pay anybody, no public servants. We don't pay the, the nurses. We don't pay the police officers. We don't pay the teachers. Uh, don't, don't do anything. Just share out the money. And they would love that. They, would, they, they like things like that. Easy things, you know, they don't have to work. That's an easy suggestion. So that is the lack of seriousness that um, is coming from the opposite. Everybody in the house laughed. And, you know, I cannot believe that that was a serious um, proposal from a member of the opposition. And it's sad. It is really, really sad to see what they are offering uh, their supporters and the representation that they are giving to their supporters. And we have always said that in any vibrant democracy, you need a good opposition. But here we have to almost challenge ourselves to be better than we were yesterday or last year because there's no challenge uh, coming from the opposition. And we would revel the opportunity to be able to get into great detail of the budget and show how our plan is superior to anything that the opposition is proposing. But when they get up and spew blatant lies and talk about things like corruption and so on, you have to, res you have to spend time to respond to that. And you only have 35 minutes to make your presentation. So you have to spend some time responding to nonsense that you hear coming from the opposition and still find some time um, to elaborate on our work, to elaborate on the successes that we have had, and to present our plans and our vision for the future. And I am fortunate uh, to come to, to be in a sector the housing and water sector, where our targets are very easily measured. 
So we came into government with a very clear plan that we have to deliver 50,000 house lots. We have, we are on target to delivering our 50,000 house lots in five years. And we have gone beyond that because from going into communities, consulting with people, meeting people on a daily basis, we realize that people have a great need for housing units to be built, for houses to be built, young professional homes, uh, low-income homes. People want a, a house that, that, that is moving ready, that is turnkey. And we have been able, um, through economies of scale, to be able to control prices in the housing market in, in the housing market. So acquiring a home through the Ministry of Housing would be cheaper than anybody going out there to try to do their own construction. And through the collaboration that we've had with the banking sector, we have seen the reduction of interest rates. Globally, across the world, with high inflation, governments across the world have been raising interest rates. So in a global economy where interest rates are being raised every single day in, the, in Europe, in, the, in, the, in, in America, in Canada, all over the world, interest rates are being raised. In Guyana, you have the opposite taking place. You have interest rates that have been year after year, say from 2020 to now, have been significantly reduced, giving people uh, more access to financing so that they can acquire that mortgage to own their own homes. And the banking sector can only do that because of the, the assurance that they have from our government, because they see a clear plan, because they see a vision, because they see the pathway to home ownership being set out very clearly. And so they can now support ordinary people and help them to acquire mortgages. So the only way that, they, that we can achieve these successes and make the progress that we have been making is through good policy making and the private sector and the banking sector sees that very clearly. They see that the government understands what we need to do, that we understand policy, and we understand the effect that good policy making has on our economy and the effect that it has on improving people's lives. Last year, and I'm trying to find last year, GBTI, I'll give you an example. Because you know when I come here, I come with my facts. So you don't have to take my word for it. Everything that I say on this program, if I say interest rates are being raised globally, you can go and check. And you will see what is happening in Europe, what is happening in, in North America. And you know that interest rates are being lowered here in Guyana. And the success of the banking sector um, is as a direct result of the work that we have been doing in government to ease the, the, the to create ease in doing business and also um, the, the rapid investment in the housing sector um, has contributed to the bank, the banking success. So in a statement released from GBTI, on August 18, 2022, um, GBTI reported an increase of 84% in its net profit after tax for the first six months of 2022. So if I tell you that the economy is doing good, that people are investing, that people are getting access more access to financing, that people are borrowing more, that people are building more, more houses and taking loans for construction. This is the result. This is what you have as a result, the corresponding result in the banking sector. You have an indigenous bank here, GBTI, reporting 
84% increase in its net profit, that's after tax, for the first six months of 2022. These are the facts. And this is as a direct result of good policy making, of prudent policy making. And an example of our understanding of what we need to do in government um, to ensure that our economy is reinstated to the place it was pre-2015 and even beyond. The, to the bank's total assets grew by 14%. The bank assets grew by 14% and deposits reached a record $135 billion. And this is just, and imagine I'm only talking about one bank. This is just one bank reporting um, the increase in its total assets by 14% for the first six months of 2022 alone. And I have to mention that the bank credited, and you can check the statement that was released last year, the bank credited the improved performance to an expanding loan portfolio, favorable market conditions, and stabilization at the national level. All of this is government intervention. That's what they're talking about. Expanding loan portfolio. If people do not have a stable economy, if people do not have, people do not see a clear vision set out by the government of Guyana, then they wouldn't invest. They wouldn't approach the bank for a mortgage or for a commercial loan to invest. So the bank wouldn't have an expanding loan portfolio if people don't go to the bank to access loans to invest in the economy. This, is as a, this shows confidence in the economy. And this is a direct result of government intervention of government policy, of stability in the economy. Favorable market conditions. Again, the government of the day has to create favorable market conditions. You can't have favorable market conditions in an undemocratic society. It starts by having a democratic society and by government leading the investment. We have the public sector investment program led by the government of Guyana. We are investing in our country, we're investing in infrastructure, and, when, and that sends a signal to investors. And people are able to see that if we are promoting tourism, for example, and we are creating the right policies to, for people to come in and invest in tourism, that's a favorable market condition for you to come in and build a hotel or for you to come in and open a new restaurant so that you can cater to the hospitality sector. Then the credited stabilization at the national level. Again, they're referring here to the government of the day, being able to stabilize the economy, to have a stable political um, atmosphere not lawlessness in government, not protests, burning, looting, a stable uh, stabilization at the national level. That requires a government that is consistent, that is stable, and consistent in policy. Because you can't say, for example, that you're going to invest in the housing sector, that you want to give 10,000 house lots and you want to build 2,000 homes, but there is no investment in the budget or no allocation in the budget for housing. So when AP and UAFC was in, was in government, for example, and we say that they only uh, distributed 7,000 house lots, in five years, and that they gave house lots in schemes that um, had no infrastructure and no plan to put in the infrastructure. The proof of that is in the budgets of 2016, 17, and 18. And I made this point 
during my presentation. There was no allocation to housing in the budget. No money. Let's put it that way then. They gave no money to the housing sector for three years consistently, 16, 17, and 18. Again, you don't have to take my word for it. You can check. You can go and get the, the estimates for the years 2016, 17, and 18. Zero subvention from the government of Guyana for the housing sector under the AP and UAFC administration. So how can you have a vibrant housing program if you're giving, allocating zero to, to the Central Housing and Planning Authority and the Ministry of Housing? Well, they had no Ministry of Housing, but they gave no money for those three years to the housing sector. The first allocation that they gave for housing was in 2019. And I don't have to remind you the year 2019 is, is the year that they were in office illegally up until elections. So after the passage of the no confidence motion in December of 2018, then they went to the House illegally, to the National Assembly illegally in 2019 to pass a budget. And that's when they gave their first allocation or they, the first time they gave money to the ministry, to, to the housing sector. And then what can they do in, in the last year in government when they're a caretaker government? How much house lots can they produce in that short space of time? They didn't even develop any plans, any new housing schemes. Not a single new house lot was developed. And so the people that they gave allocations to during the period where they were illegally in office, during the caretaker period, we had to come in in, 28, in 2020 and allocate sums of money to do the infrastructure work so, so those people, about 2,000 people, during the five-month period and, and the first three months of the year leading up to the elections, when they were giving out house lots as an election gimmick. But we honored all of those allocations. And the first budget that we passed, the emergency budget of 2020, was to do the infrastructure work in our housing schemes so that those people who they allocated could benefit. And then we had to make our own allocations and invest more money in infrastructure, in new housing schemes. So we have some catching up to do. And this, these are the things people need to understand. See, I see my operator already signaling to me that I am almost out of time. Uh, but these are the things um, people need to understand so, so they will appreciate why sometimes it takes so long to get things done. When you had five years in office and didn't invest any money in a sector and didn't start to produce house lots so that the infrastructure work can be ahead of the allocations. When you've had five years of no investment, it's, a, it's an onerous task for us to now come in to have to keep up with both allocations and infrastructure. But we are doing it. We're not backing down from that task. And we are, we are maxing out capacity in terms of our contractors and labor and in, in our construction sector so that we can keep up or that we can keep abreast with our allocation program. But people who have their allocation have nothing to fear. We are working to ensure that all of the necessary infrastructure is in place. We're working to ensure we build those treatment plants to keep our promise on the coastline of 90% treated water by 2025. We are working in our hinterland regions to ensure that we keep our promise there as well of 100% access to water by uh, 2025. And I just came back from a two-day trip to Region 8, where we are 
by the end of 2023, we will be about 90% coverage of access to water in that region. And that is one of the hardest regions to work in because the terrain is very rough and, and people live far distances from each other. And so it's a lot of investment to be able to take water to, to each community and to each household um, in the regions. But we are working assiduously nonetheless. And I did um, want to go into some more details this evening, but in terms of the budget, but um, again, the, the, the hour flew by so quickly. But what I can say in conclusion tonight is that this budget is consistent with all of the policies, the programs, the vision, and the commitments that we made to the people of our country. When we came to the people in 2020 and we asked our people to support us and to vote for us, we came with a plan. We didn't come with empty hands. We came with a plan, we came with a vision, we elaborated on that vision, we laid out all of the programs that we will, that we will implement if elected to government. And from the moment President Ali was sworn in, we started to roll out. We started to keep our promises. We kept our 100-day promises within 100 days. Within a matter of days, we restored all of those uh, programs that we had before. We reinstated all of those uh, programs, assistance programs that we had before. And we started to roll out all of the work in the healthcare sector, in the education sector, tourism, housing, water, all of it, our scholarship program. This year, this year, by the end of 2023, we will accomplish 20,000 scholarship. And that was what we committed to in our manifesto. By the end of 2023, we will have surpassed the award of 20,000 scholarships um, to those who are desirous of studying. And we will go beyond because we're not in 2025 as yet, but it doesn't mean the end the end of the scholarship program. We will go beyond. Every Guyanese who is desirous of studying will have an opportunity to study. We will make university education free. That is a commitment that we made and it will happen. So we have done a lot, but we have a lot more to do. And I think that people can rest easy knowing that the government is committed to getting this work done because every day they see plans being implemented and programs being implemented to make all of those uh, commitments a reality. So that is our task in government now for the next half of our term, the other two and a half years, is ensuring that we implement all of our commitments in every sector. So all we have to do with this budget and going forward is to continue in the same vein and along the same pattern that we have been governing and leading over the past two and a half years. So with that, I am completely out of time, but again, I want to thank you this evening for joining me. If you haven't shared this program as yet, please do so now. Please click that share button um, so that uh, we can reach as many people as possible. Thank you again. Have a safe rest of the week. Join me again, same time, same place next week. God bless you.